Okay, so in this lecture we talked about blood, we talked about the heart, we talked a little bit about lymphatics. So starting with blood, blood is a connective tissue. Obviously, um, it's found in the heart, it's found in blood vessels. Those are really the only places it should be found. There are two main components to blood. There is the formed elements. That's considered the cellular component because it contains either cells or fragments of cells, in the case of platelets, and also plasma, which is the fluid component. So if it's oxygen-rich blood, it tends to be bright red, and if it's deoxygenated or oxygen-poor, it's dark red. Of course, pH of blood is 7.35 to 7.45. Blood temperature is always a little bit higher than body temperature, and that's just because of the friction generated from the blood as it moves through the blood vessels. So if you take a um, test tube of blood and you spin it down in a centrifuge, you'll get three layers. You'll get the hematocrit, which is just packed red blood cells. You'll get this little layer here called the buffy coat, which contains white blood cells and platelets. That's the, the, the smallest component of blood. And then the largest component is plasma, which is mostly water, but also all of your, your dissolved solutes. Okay. So blood plasma, again, about 90% water. Lots of stuff here. This is where you're going to find all of your ions, uh, glucose, hormones, plasma proteins, such as albumin, which is the most abundant plasma protein. And here you can see this is the plasma, straw-colored. So the formed elements this is the other, uh, the cellular component of blood. Includes red blood cells or erythrocytes, white blood cells, which are leukocytes, and platelets. So the red blood cells, erythrocytes, they are anucleate. They don't have a nucleus. They really don't even have any organelles. They're just bags of hemoglobin. Okay, and hemoglobin, of course, is the protein that transports oxygen, mostly oxygen, but also some carbon dioxide. So red blood cells are flexible. They need to be flexible so they can fit through very small capillaries. Um, so in hemoglobin, it has a globe, a globin portion, a globular portion, and a heme portion. And there are four hemes per hemoglobin molecule. And each of those hemes contains iron. And iron can bind O2. Okay. So leukocytes, um, these are complete cells, meaning they have a nucleus, they have organelles, all of that sort of stuff. And there are the granulocytes and agranulocytes. So the granulocytes are the basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils. And the agranulocytes are the lymphocytes, like BNT cells, and the monocytes. So leukocyte pathology, leukocytosis, this is an increase in the number of white blood cells. Uh, happens oftentimes during infection, can also occur in cancers. Uh, leukopenia, this is a low number of white blood cells. This can also be caused by uh, infections, but also some drugs, like prednisone. So leukemia and lymphoma. They are related but different. So leukemia is obviously a cancer that results in um, too many abnormal white blood cells that are that are uh, coming from the, the bone marrow, whereas lymphoma involves only lymphoid cells and typically is focused in the lymphatics, like the lymph nodes. And then infectious mononucleosis is a viral disease, can be caused by different viruses, most commonly Epstein-Barr virus. And basically here you have... Uh, very, very high numbers of agranulocytes, uh, and they are typically atypical. So if you, if you look at them under the microscope, they are abnormal. So platelets are known as thrombocytes, and really they are just fragments of very, very large cells called megakaryocytes. And they will have little granules like uh, serotonin, containing serotonin, certain enzymes, growth factors, and of course we need platelets for clotting. So hemostasis, this is the process of, of stopping bleeding. And there are three main steps. The first one is the vascular spasm, which is vasoconstriction. You know, this is important to, um, to limit the amount of blood that's getting to the area. Uh, the second step is the formation of the platelet plug. So basically, this, this damaged endothelial layer over here um, causes the release of collagen into the lumen of the blood vessel. That causes platelets to kind of attach. That forms the platelet plug. And then um, the final step is coagulation, which um, causes the activation of thrombin. Thrombin will actually is an enzyme, and it activates fibrinogen, which forms fibrin. 
fibrin just uh, basically makes a mesh that kind of reinforces the platelet plug. So this is a fibrin mesh. So obviously we don't th we don't want these clots to um, hang around forever. So the process of removing these is fibrinolysis. So during that process of clotting, an enzyme or an inactive enzyme known as plasminogen is incorporated into that clot. Okay. And the clot that formed will, will cause endothelial cells, remember those are the cells that line the blood vessel, to produce something known as TP, uh, TPA, which is tissue plasminogen activator. So this will activate um, plasminogen into the active form plasmin, and plasmin will break down that fibrin mesh and um, kind of start the process of dissolving that clot. So we talked about the blood groups. Um, you know, they're just based on these terminal saccharides, whether or not they have it or not. I, I don't really, I'm not too concerned with blood groups at this point. Same thing with the RH blood groups. Um, these were more of just fun fact slides. We talked about this in micro. All right, then we started talking about the heart. So the heart obviously is um, found in the mediastinum and the pericardial cavity. It's anterior to the vertebral column, of course, posterior to the sternum. It's very well protected. Uh, the base of the heart is actually on the posterior superior surface, so it's uh, more towards the head and kind of towards the back, and the apex points uh, right towards the left hip. Okay, so you can see here, sits right between the lungs. Um, here's the apex, the base is back there, and of course the heart is very well protected. So the coverings of the heart, there are two, um, there are two walls uh, that protect the heart or cover the heart and that's called the pericardium. The outermost layer, the outer wall, is called the fibrous pericardium, which is this right here. And basically what this does is it just kind of anchors the heart to surrounding structures. Okay. It also uh, will help to protect it. Now, the second wall, or the inner wall, of the pericardium is called the serous pericardium, and it's called that because it produces serous fluid. And there are two layers. There's a parietal layer, which is really just the deep surface of the fibrous pericardium. So this right here, if you cut this and just kind of turn it inside out, that, that underside is really the parietal layer of the serous pericardium. And the visceral layer is directly on the heart itself, and it's known as the epicardium. And the space between this, oops, the space between this parietal layer and visceral layer is known as the pericardial cavity, and it has fluid in there, and that just helps reduce friction as the heart beats. So again, this is inside the heart, this is the, uh, the muscle of the heart, this is the visceral, uh, the visceral layer of the serous pericardium, also known as the epicardium. This is the parietal layer, which is just on the other side of the fibrous pericardium. So um, the space between the, the visceral and parietal layers is the pericardial cavity. So the three main layers of the heart are the epicardium, which we just talked about. The myocardium, which is the muscle, that's the thickest layer of the heart. Uh, and then the endocardium, endocardium, which lines the, the inside of the, of the hearts. Okay, so you can just see these three layers. So here's the endocardium, which is lining the, the ventricles and the atrium the inside of the heart. This is the myocardium, the muscular layer. And of course, the epicardium right out here. So the heart has four chambers, two atria, two ventricles. The, uh, the atria are separated from each other by the interatrial septum. The ventricles are separated by each other from the interventricular, or via the interventricular septum. Remember, the right side and the left sides of the heart do not communicate with each other. So that's some more of this anatomy. So the atria, the atria are the receiving chambers. They receive blood from the circulation. The right atrium is going to receive blood from the system. Okay, from the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus, which is this guy right here. So the coronary sinus is actually going to bring blood back from the coronary veins. And the left atrium is going to receive blood from the pulmonary veins coming from the lungs. And those are going to be carrying oxygenated blood. So the ventricles are the discharging chambers. Okay. So the right ventricle is going to pump blood into the pulmonary trunk. That will, that will uh, direct blood eventually to the lungs. And the left ventricle will pump blood into the aorta, which will eventually go to the system, to the body. So the heart has valves. There are four of them. 
and the purpose of these valves are to ensure that blood only flows in an enterograde fashion, only forward and not backwards. So the atrioventricular valves are between the atria and the ventricles. The one on the right side is known as the tricuspid valve, and the one on the left side is known as the bicuspid or mitral valve. And these, these valves are anchored to these muscles in the ventricles called papillary muscles. And these papillary muscles have these little collagen extensions called chordae tendinae, and that's, they contact the valve flaps themselves. So if you go here, these are the papillary muscles, these are the chordae tendinae, and this is the valve. Now the semilunar valves, these are between the ventricles and the, the large vessels that are leaving the heart. The pulmonic valve is found between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk, and the aortic valve is found between the uh, left ventricle and the, the aorta. Okay, so here's the pulmonic valve, here's the aortic valve. So again, this is the tricuspid valve, this is the bicuspid or the mitral valve, pulmonic valve, aortic valve. So the heart pumps in two separate circulations because the right and left sides of the heart are separate from each other. So the right side pumps to into the pulmonary circulation. Okay, so it receives deoxygenated blood from the body and pumps it to the lungs so it can get reoxygenated. The left side of the heart is going to receive oxygenated blood from the lungs and then pumps it to the body. And they pump the same volume of blood. They have to or else blood would accumulate somewhere. So blood flow through the heart. So let's go through this really quickly. So if we start in the right atrium, we go from the right atrium, we go through the uh, tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Then we go into the pulmonic valve, pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries to the lungs. Then that blood comes back uh, through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, uh, through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, uh, into the aortic valve, into the aorta, out to the body. Okay. And if you were lucky enough to listen to my song, hopefully that helps. So again, this I just threw this slide in just because the book talks about the coronary circulation, but it's really just uh, a, a portion of the systemic circulation. Okay, just saying that the heart receives blood um, via coronary arteries. Okay, which are just branches of the aorta. It's a part of the systemic circulation, and then cardiac veins will take deoxygenated blood to the coronary sinus which we already talked about, empties into the right atrium. All right, then we talked about the intrinsic conduction system of the heart. Okay, so the heart can pump, the heart muscle cells can contract without any input from the nervous system. Now, it does have input from the nervous system, but it can beat without it. So let's talk about these, these cells. They're, they're considered autorhythmic cells because they can, they can depolarize by themselves. And they can do that because they have an unstable resting membrane potential. And this is known as pacemaker potential. So let's talk about each of these components. So the first one, actually I'm just going to use this picture to talk about all of them. So the first component of the intrinsic conduction system is the SA node right here. So the SA node is the pacemaker. It depolarizes faster than any other component. And what it does is it's going to depolarize the atria. Um, and then it's going to send impulses down to the AV node. That's very important because the AV node receives these impulses and then, sl and then basically slows them down. And what that allows is that allows the atria to continue and finish their contraction before the ventricles start to contract. We want these to contract at different times. If they contract at the same time, we wouldn't pump blood anywhere. So SA node depolarizes the, um, the atria, sends impulses down to the AV node, AV node slows those impulses. The next component is called the AV bundle or the bundle of his. And the AV bundle is the only electrical connection between the atria and the ventricles. Now the AV bundle will send impulses to the left and right bundle branches which are found here in the interventricular septum. And then these will lead into the Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers will depolarize the ventricles. Okay. So make sure you know those big components about um, each of these, um, each of these uh, members of the conduction system. So again, these are all just the words. Okay, then we talked about the EKG. So again, I'm just going to use this picture. 
So there are three main events occurring in the EKG, which is just a, a graphical representation of electricity in the heart, pretty much. The first big event is the P wave. The P wave is um, basically represents depolarization of the atria, okay, the SA node. Then you have the QRS complex. QRS complex is uh, ventricular depolarization. And then the T wave is um, ventricular repolarization. Now there are a couple other things. I mean, there's a lot more going on here. Like the PR segment, this is uh, pretty much the, the delay at the AV node. The U wave is the, the finishing of repolarization of the Purkinje fibers, but just know these three big events. So the P wave, QRS complex, and T wave. And again, this is just showing the same stuff. Okay, cardiac output. This is just the amount of blood that's pumped by each ventricle in a minute. And it's given by the equation cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. Heart rate is obviously the number of heartbeats per minute. And stroke volume is the, the amount of blood or the volume of blood that's pumped by one ventricle per heartbeat. So you multiply those together and that's how you can get cardiac output. And obviously this is going to vary from person to person. Okay, then we talked about blood vessels. So blood vessels are obviously the structures that carry blood. Uh, we have arteries and veins. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Veins carry blood to the heart. And then capillaries are the junction between them. Okay, they are the ones that join arteries and veins. Okay, and this is also where gas is going to be exchanged. So most blood vessels, not all, uh, will have three layers. The tunica intima, tunica media, tunica externa. And depending on the vessel, the composition of each of these can vary a lot. Well, the tunica intima is always endothelium, okay? Um, so the tunica intima is endothelial tissue, contacts the inside, the lumen of the blood vessel. It's the, you know, the structure that blood will contact. The tunica media is the middle layer, and this is, uh, you know, typically going to be smooth muscle. Okay, that's going to allow things like vasoconstriction. And then the outer layer is called the tunica externa, and this is just connective tissue that pretty much anchors blood vessels to other structures. Now capillaries, capillaries are the smallest blood vessels, and they really only have one layer, and that's the intima, okay, um, the endothelium. And of course capillaries' main function is to exchange gases, exchange hormones, nutrients, okay, with the, with the cells. There are three structural types of capillaries. There are continuous, fenestrated, and sinusoidal types. They're found in different areas. We talked about that. I really don't care so much that you know. Um, just understand that there are these three structural types. So here's a capillary bed. This is the arterial end. This is the venous end. So blood comes in, Okay, enters the capillary bed. You're going to have exchange with tissue cells of whatever sort of things. And then this uh, venous side will drain this capillary bed. So again, the venous system is going to carry blood to the heart. Venules, uh, they're basically the first structures that form when capillaries unite. They're very porous. This allows things like white blood cells, like fluid, to move through their walls. Um, and then these will eventually join to form veins. Okay. And again, here we can see artery, capillary bed, vein. Uh, so veins, they tend to have much thinner walls than arteries, but they have bigger lumens. Um, and the veins will hold about 65% of the body's blood at any particular time. So really they serve as blood reservoirs um, or capacitance vessels. Okay, they can hold blood. And, um, you know, the autonomic nervous system can cause constriction of those, those veins if we need to get more blood to the heart. So this is a, a histological section. Here's an artery. This is a vein. This actually in here is a lymphatic vessel, but um, don't worry about that. As you can see, the walls of the veins are much thinner than the artery. So some of the veins have valves, especially the veins in the limbs. And just like the valves in the heart, their job is to prevent retrograde flow, to prevent blood from flowing backwards. So venous return, this is the amount of blood that returns to the heart and is influenced by things like the skeletal muscle pump, which is this here. Okay, As your muscles contract, it squeezes on these veins and pushes blood up. Uh, venous capacitance. Uh, remember, these are capacitance vessels. They can hold blood, and the sympathetic nervous system can cause vasoconstriction of those vessels to increase 
the amount of uh, return to the heart. Also the respiratory pump, which really works the same way as the skeletal muscle pump, it just works in the abdominal and thoracic cavities. So here's the skeletal muscle pump. So a portal system, you know, we talked about arteries, feed capillary beds, and then they are drained by veins. In a portal system, you have two capillary beds in a row, okay, and they are joined by a vein. So basically, um, capillary bed drains into another capillary bed um, without going through the heart first. There are two really big examples in the body. Don't worry about it right now. Just understand what a portal system is. Okay, then we talked really briefly about lymphatic system. So lymphatic system is composed of lymphatic vessels, which are very, very similar to, to veins. Uh, lymph, which is the fluid inside of the lymphatic vessels, and lymph nodes, which lymph will drain through or, or filter through. So lymphatic vessels, um, again, this is a, a system very much like the, the venous system, but they are basically going to collect excess fluid and return it to the blood. Okay. And this excess fluid, which we talked about way back when, when we talked about like capillary hydrostatic pressure and, and edema and all that stuff, you know, this fluid is forced out at the capillary bed. The capillary beds are very, very small, so this fluid is pushed out. And most of that fluid will re-enter those leaky venules, but whatever doesn't re-enter will be picked up by the lymphatic system. Okay, And once this fluid is in the lymphatics, it's called lymph. So the smallest vessels are lymphatic capillaries. And these lymphatic capillaries, I'm just going to go to the picture, uh, th they're kind of set up like this. Here is our arterial end of the capillary bed, here's the capillary bed of course, here's the venous end. So blood comes in, fluid's pushed out, and these capillaries just kind of weave their way through this, this capillary bed, and they will drain that excess fluid that was forced out. Okay? And just like veins, they come together to form bigger and bigger and bigger structures until um, they get into the lymphatic ducts. The ducts are the largest of the lymphatic vessels. There are two main ones. There's the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. The thoracic duct is the largest lymph vessel in the body. It's very large. You can see this here. But the, the big takeaway is that you know these, these vessels get bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually drain into the blood. So the uh, thoracic trunk will, will drain into the junction of the left subclavian and the left internal jugular vein and then that will get back to the heart very easily and the uh, the right thoracic duct will do the same thing but on the right side okay so that's how lymph how that excess fluid gets back into the blood and back to the heart so the the three main functions of lymphatic vessels obviously return excess fluid to the bloodstream return any proteins that leaked out into the blood and also they will be really important for the absorption of lipids from the intestines which you will talk about in nutrition um, so I just kind of hit some of the highlights here. If I skip things in, in this video, that probably means they're not all that important. And as always, if you have any questions, please let me know.